Welcome. It's September 10th and 2017, and I believe this is our 12th Chalcedon Q&A session. Uh, I'm Martin Salbretti, Vice President of the Chalcedon Foundation, President Scholar, except I don't actually reside at Chalcedon. Uh, but with the internet, anything's possible in terms of residency. Uh, we're all members of one another, as the scriptures tell us. Uh, Andrea's here. So, we have some leftover business from last week that we are going to uh, engage at this point. Um, welcome Charles and Chuck. And uh, we're going to uh, dig in at this point. We had two outstanding questions at least. There's a third which just slipped my mind, but uh, the two big ones would be, what do I think of the Nashville statement, or what is the Chalcedon's view of it? which would be presumptuous for me to say, since, like I said, Chalcedon is not monolithic in all particulars, but I'll give you what I think is a, a fair assessment of what's going on with the Nashville Statement. I'll tell you what it is if you don't know, but it's certainly making the rounds, and it's in the media big time. And also the question was posed, are police legitimate? So that's going to be the follow-up question, and well, it turns out that we'll actually be using some information from the first question to help uh, frame the second question. So about this Nashville statement, it was a group of about 150 odd, um, well, odd number, <laughs> it was 153, something like that, evangelical scholars from across the uh, reformed and semi-reformed and maybe not so reformed uh, Christian spectrum, who got together and um, assigned a document that affirmed certain truths uh, that were couched in respect to the relationship of the sexes and um, in fact, basically, it confronts the entire question of sexual morality. It's a reaffirmation, or at least an attempt to reaffirm, uh, biblical morality. Now, when you have that many people signing a single document, there is always the risk that in order to get everyone to agree, there may have been some measure of compromise, an adjustment of language to get everyone to say, well, if you change this word, or change that term, or soften this, or... Uh, go easy on soft pedal that, uh, I can sign that. So the question is, to what extent has this document been potentially compromised? Uh, Pastor Sean Mathis out in Colorado has drawn attention in his uh, blog uh, to exactly some of these issues. Is Has it been softened? Uh, is it really as strong a biblical statement as can be had? Or were there some um, fuzzing over of the boundaries? in order to make it more acceptable and to get more people to sign up to it. That is always a, an issue with ecumenicism, is that the terms of agreement may involve changing content. So we're going to talk about that uh, somewhat, uh, especially toward the close of our discussion on the Nashville Statement, pointing out, in fact, that there's some alternative statements uh, that have arisen in the meantime, since the, I think it was August 27th or August 30th, when it first appeared, at least most of the reactions appeared on the 30th and beyond. So it's current events. We've been, in the last couple of weeks, we've been uh, thrashing this about, and of course it made instantly uh, headlines all over the place. Uh, now, the other side did not see anything remotely soft-pedaled in the Nashville statement. The opponents of it instantly saw it as um, transparent misogyny. I'm looking at one of the sources here. Uh, some of the more liberal seminaries, here's a statement from the um, Auburn Seminary uh, by the gentleman who wrote it, Brian McLaren, says, Why I applaud and firmly deny the Nashville Statement. And he talks about how this is a discredited way of reading the Bible. And uh, the statement plays into the same virulent scapegoating that has encouraged the KKK and other white supremacists to take off their sheets. So he says, basically, the... Um, the evangelicals have torpedoed themselves by coming out in the open. In fact, he continues on why he applauds the statement that he denies. Uh, it makes explicit, he says, what has been hidden. In other words, uh, the evangelicals have not mentioned much about this topic, and all of a sudden they've uh, crawled out of the woodwork to say, okay, well, our actual position is X, Y, or Z. And uh, therefore, he says it puts pressure on LGBTQ sympathetic evangelicals to decide whether they're going to stick with these churches that have come up with the Nashville Statement. In other words, now that you've put this toxic document out in the view of McLaren, uh, this is going to force folks with a more um, Christian view, as he puts it, <laughs> uh, into the open and say, hey, you need to um, 
have an exodus out of these churches that hold to the Bible in this discredited way. And then, of course, he says this, uh, the third thing that he applauds is it means that LGBTQ-friendly churches uh, will now open their doors and welcome the evangelical refugees who found that the Nashville Statement was, in fact, uh, a totalitarian uh, pogrom of some sort. So we can see that the negative reactions to Nashville's statement uh, are pretty clear, that not a single component of it is, is worthwhile. Now, most people reading the Nashville Statement from our perspective would look at it and say they, they bent over backwards to be accommodating and gracious. That's not the way the other side sees it. In fact, they go out of their way to condemn it uh, on several different points. You know, one guy, this is uh, Bill Leonard, uh, writing in the um, the Baptist News Global, which is interesting to me that that's where he's writing from. He's basically saying, hey, look, folks, there's there's issues here uh, in terms of... Um, and he, he gives an entire litany of all these folks that have... Uh yeah, here we go. He says, to claim the high moral ground as arbiters of biblical manhood or womanhood is to live there, so it would be helpful to know how many signatories cut a moral ethical deal to vote for Donald Trump, the most publicly lascivious chief executive since Bill Clinton. Uh, those who voted a Trump ticket could have confessed the obvious that they were, were silent about or closed their eyes to Trump's long-term sex-laced behaviors, immorality they denounce, and the rest of us gay or straight, etc., uh, etc. Et this is when one of their number, Russell Moore, spoke out, Southern Baptist Convention Trumpanistas silenced him forthwith. Signers don't dictate morality to certain Americans that you don't demand of you the president. So, of course, the, the big calling here with this writer is hypocrisy. Uh, aren't you guys being hypocrites putting this forward? You say this in this area, but when it suits you, you will dump uh, sexual morality as any kind of serious topic. You will uh, brush it under the carpet and the rug uh, when you're in the uh, voting booth. So what happens then, of course, is that we get challenged on this front. Uh, and rightfully so, it seems to me. No, that man called it. This is an interesting response to the Nashville Statement, I found. It calls it the, uh, it's the Religious Rights Death Rattle by Sarah Jones. It was published just five days ago uh, on the New Republic. And she basically equates it with the victory that uh, William James Bryant had over Clarence Darrow in the uh, Scopes trial. He says, in other words, it was a pyrrhic victory. Uh, it looked like it was a victory, and it ended up being the, uh, the end of um, creationism taught in schools of any kind. So you can see the, the issues that are being framed here, uh, and she makes a very interesting point about that uh, in terms of it being the religious rights death rattle. And, of course, the religious, religious right, boy, that's a tough thing to say, uh, is, in fact, a hypocritical. Perhaps there's a sense in which it is the death rattle makes sense. Now... You can't have a manifesto without someone else putting a counter-manifesto out there. <laughs> and, of course, there were at least three that went out there. The Denver uh, Statement, the Liturgist uh, Statement, and then the Christians United, uh, which is in support of LGBT plus inclusion in the Church. And they have a counter-statement in which they condemn, in the strongest possible terms, the uh, Nashville Statement. And what is interesting to me is that they've, of course, uh, identified a brand new sin, which is exclusion. Whatever sins were identified in the Nashville Statement, some of which were, as we suggested, potentially soft-pedaled, uh, they're not going to back off on the other side. They're very clear that this is a grievous evil sin, and it is time for this exclusive notion that the Nashville Statement puts forward uh, to be roundly condemned and, and routed. And, of course, it's signed by, by a host of uh, theological uh, wor well, worthies. Uh, at least they have all the right t titles in front of their name and the letters behind their name. Uh, a good number of them are female ministers, so that lets you know that uh, they're putting in a, a stake in the ground saying, no, we're not leaving this territory. Uh, we're here to stay. So all that to say, the response to the Nashville Statement is uh, crystal clear. They, they condemn it. So for us, on our side, to point out its weaknesses misses another issue, which is the other side doesn't see anything weak. They, they say any time a Christian even peeps its, his head up and asserts anything out of the Scripture, he's to be uh, immediately um, strong-armed and condemned. 
And so the response has been uh, society-wide, culture-wide, and uh, I'm virtually militant. Of course, interesting to re read someone here saying, quoting from, of all places, uh, Romans 12, you know, you uh, overcome uh, evil with good. So they say, we will overcome the evil of the Nashville Statement with our good inclusiveness. We will overthrow the sin of exclusion with the uh, virtue of inclusion. So, so before I comment on, on this, now I'm, right now I'm just doing a survey uh, to let you know what's going on with this Nashville Statement. Let's talk about the fact that there are those Christians who said, you know, that Nashville Statement could use a little work. And so at least one individual uh, over at Warhorn, uh, Pastor Tim Bailey, has put together a uh, what he calls the Nashville Statement Fortified. Fortified in the sense that whatever weaknesses he saw uh, in the original thing, things like omissions, um, language that was doctored up perhaps to uh, get more signatories to agree to sign it, uh, he's corrected those things by and large. And to put that forward and say, here's a better way to deal with the Nashville Statement that is more faithful to Scripture. Now, what interested me is when this came out on Facebook and it was being shared around various Reformed uh, circles, I would still see comments saying, well, it's, it's better than the other one, but I would still like to see this language changed and that language changed. You see, it's not going to please everybody. Uh, unless it's canonical scripture, there's always going to be some level at which our systematizations are going to fail. You're going to say, you left this out, you left that out, that word I don't like, I prefer this term. Uh, this term uh, honors or glorifies or rec recognizes A, B, or C, and we ought not to do these things. So even with a fortified Nashville statement, we have uh, Christians that are saying, well, yeah, that's better than the original, but that's not saying a lot. And the Nashville statement itself has is, is gotten into uh, its own hot water as a result. And, not surprisingly, in Facebook, we have demands, hey, have you signed this yet? Has your pastor signed it? It's been two weeks now. Uh, it's Sunday. You're going to confront your pastor and have you sign up to the Nashville Statement. At the same time that there's a fortified statement circulating uh, for folks to potentially sign. So what's at stake here? What's going on? This is where it gets kind of interesting to me. Uh, of all things, I'm going to draw attention to Rush Juni's commentary on Daniel. And you're going to see why in just a minute or two, if you will bear with me. He's talking about the 11th chapter in particular. And it's this. It's talking about the uh, the enemy uh, that's being spoken of here. Uh, his headquarters would be located midway between the sea and the mountain, that is the temple. And he goes through and says that the triumph of this uh, particular um, message. Now, by the way, just to be crystal clear, I'm not, he, Rush Dooney is not in any way saying that uh, what we're seeing here with all this Nashville Statement uh, controversy is a direct fulfillment of some prophecy in Daniel 11. He, Rush Dooney was an idealist, which meant that he said that there's a key lessons here for the entire church age. So the biblical shoe fits, it can wear, be worn, in other words. So don't see this as, oh, it's, it's a direct fulfillment of prophecy. Rather, it's that the principles of this scripture are in play here with all due respect to my uh, my good friend and fellow warrior, Jay Rogers, who might say it's purely preteristic and has been long since fulfilled. In Rush Dooney's view, this is uh, a continual fulfillment in, during the latter days of the church age, during which we live, and has been true for centuries. So let's take a look. It says, The triumph of this evil will be especially notable in terms of the church, wherein in an organic concept of man, the state and the church will cause many to stumble, as the concept invades and corrupts the church. Instead of the older legalistic rationalism, the Hellenistic concept of the great chain of being will be the more basic concept in either realm. The slavery of the church will not be the obvious one of bondage in Egypt, but of Hellenic overlordship with the appearance of freedom. Uh, obvious evil, as of Egypt, gives way to the sophisticated evil and seeming good of Syria, its desire for social and religious unity, its affirmation of the apotheosis of man, its organic concept of man in society as set in the context, not of scripture, but of the great chain of being. Evil triumphs, therefore, as a seeming good. Self-righteousness and the worship of man becomes virtues and are promoted as against all antisocial evils and all otherworldly faiths. Catch that? Antisocial evils. That's how statements like the Nashville Statement are being couched as. Antisocial evils. And this position also means a radical syncretism. 
syncretism means a combination of a Christian faith with an alien faith and an anti-Christian faith mixed together. So we kind of get the, the best or is it the worst of both worlds. So that the order of the day becomes neither the open warfare of Antiochus Epiphanes of the Seleucid dynasty in around, say, 185 BC or so, in his attempt to absorb Israel into Syria, nor the outright persecution of Rome, or the radical and legalistic separation of religion and the state by the sons of Rome. Rather, it becomes syncretism, the mixture of the Christian faith with alien faiths, alien commitments, alien worldviews. The sea is the world, as in Revelation 7.15, and the glorious holy mountain is a frequent type or symbol of the true church. Thus, evil as it develops becomes more obviously self-righteousness and syncretism becomes an attempt to have the power of God and the form of godliness in radical contempt thereof. When he concludes his discussion, this is on page 79, and what I'm turning to is discussions from 78, 78, 77, 78, 79, in the book, Thy Kingdom Come, Studies in Daniel and Revelation. He points out that this uh, new approach, this new faith, this is, it can speak the language of the body of Christ, but its meaning has a radically different intent. Its headquarters is therefore fittingly between the world and the church. Even as the organic state and the legalistic state struggled for the Old Testament people and their land, with legalism triumphing imperially and from within Israel triumphing religiously, so the two shall struggle for the Christian church, with the triumph at first going to legalism and then but not finally to organicism. And that's where we are right now, is that hostility of organicism. Uh, everything that Rashtuni says here is true, and what we find is that if you stake any ground between the temple of God and the world at large, which is between the sea and the mountain of God, which is what's depicted in Daniel 11.45, you have a compromising position. And that's where the headquarters are <laughs> uh, for this particular organic concept where all the antisocial ills are attacked and a new good uh, invades the church and contaminates it with its toxic message. Uh, God will, of course, overthrow it. Nonetheless, it's important for us to get the big picture here. He had Jay Rogers also has written an excellent uh, commentary on uh, Daniel from a preterist perspective. And as I, I'm always a sympathetic critic of preterism. Uh, certainly with the book of Revelation, I'm a sympathetic critic. But other books, I think it applies uh, far more consistently. And I look forward to reading and likely endorsing uh, Jay's uh, handiwork with his book, In the Days of Those Kings, uh, which is the title of his uh, commentary on Daniel. Uh, which will publish soon. So in any event, uh, getting back to this whole issue, what is going on here is, of course, is the question of, of social power and, and eminence. And so that when the Christians compromise, if they put themselves anywhere other than the smack dab in the center of the temple of God and the claims of God exactly as God delivered them, uh, you are now the rightful prey of the other side because they will catch us in our inconsistencies. In fact, that's exactly what most of these attacks on the national statement are promoting, is the inconsistency of the Christian position. Says, oh, you know, based on your, the right reading of the Bible, you've justified all these sins over the uh, centuries. And now you're coming back to us and opposing LGBTQ? You know, your your uh, hypocrisy is showing. Your inconsistency is showing. Your smorgasbord approach to Christian Christianity is showing. As a consequence, the Nashville Statement uh, it shows as much the weakness of the Christian faith and its way it's formulated uh, in a compromised way. Uh, so it's pretty bad when if, if the only thing that's out there uh, and everyone's saying you should sign up for this uh, has problems already because of where it's positioned on this spectrum. Because the only safe place is to be hunkered down on Scripture. And uh, scripture as it's actually delivered by the, by the mouth of God. And we don't find this. So, in terms of the Nashville Statement, it reveals a more, lot more about us than it does about the other side. We expected the other side to come through exactly as Rashtuni pointed out when he comments on Daniel 11. Uh, this is a, a given. This is consistent behavior. They are more consistent with their worldview than we are with ours. And so they are to be credited with having assembled the toolkit to nail the Christians for the hypocrisy in putting these statements out and then, with the other hand, uh, operating against biblical morality and uh, shoving lots of scripture under the table and under the rug. So it's going to be a shaking out process for all of us. 
next topic that came up last week was, are the police legitimate? Talk about a complex question here. Uh, we could back up a step and say, is sin legitimate? Now, why do I bring this up? Uh, the, the question is because because the uh, I'm just looking at Justin Ryan's comment about recommendation of another book besides the Word and Season series. Uh, I'll certainly take a look at uh, Good Morning Friends, which is the radio messages by Rush Dooney, which is also just now coming out. The first volume came out, and it reads a lot like the uh, Word and Seasons. Uh, they're a little bit longer. But they are also a bit meatier. Meatier as in M-E-A-T-I-E-R, not the thing flying across the sky. So, police, policemen. What we have here is a very common phenomenon uh, that's modern. It's a contemporary phenomenon. People don't realize that the nature or the relationship of the state governments, or the state governments, the civil governments, to the people has always been a difficult one. And when I was in Australia just uh, last month, I had to make a comment. I said, you know, Rush Tony pointed out that there was a reason that city planners decided to stop making the streets curved. Let's make them straight. The reason that they're to be made straight is so that the uh, authorities could run a cannonade down through the street to control the population when it gets uppity, when it's uh, no longer uh, under uh, controllable. So the whole point is that, uh, it's been repeated over and over again, particularly by those of a libertarian bent, is that external enemies are an occasional problem. But your populace of your, is a 24-7 problem. And so unless you are operating under full biblical law, uh, you're going to have to punt. And one of the ways that we punt, and have punted in the last century and a half, is with the mounting authority and power of the police. Uh, one of the issues that comes across here uh, is, and we mentioned it last week, is this question of immunity. Once you say, well, the police should be immune from A, B, and C, uh, otherwise we can't hire them if they're not immune from the consequences of their actions, uh, now we've created a special class. Now why, and of course, uh, the immunities that uh, Scripture refers to are the immunity of the innocent. If a person, an individual, is innocent, then that uh, his, he's immune from being charged with things. Except under social justice premises, if he's a member of a group, the group can be charged and he can be guilty even though he's individually innocent. He is not immune from the claim of the group. So social, social justice concepts are completely incompatible with individual justice, and the Bible promotes individual justice and not social justice. If everyone gets individual justice, you don't have any need for the so-called modern form of social justice. Why do I bring all this up? Because the second we have, and we have this here in Austin, Texas, in the last uh, legislative session, there was a bill saying we're going to want to make uh, an attack on a policeman a hate crime. And, of course, that meant that we do now have respected persons, because the law, in fact, uh, was put into effect, despite uh, some very well-meaning Christians rightfully saying there's supposed to be one law for everybody. Everyone's under the exact same standard. There is no preferential treatment the policemen are under the same standard as you or I or anyone else. And the uh, folks at the Capitol decided, I'm not going to get voted back in if I vote against this. I'm out. I need to go with the blue. So they have elevated the police to a special class. Now, the reason I'm bringing this up and tying this back to the Nashville Statement is this. The Nashville Statement is all about identity politics, pure and simple, identity politics. What had the police just done in Austin? They have promoted identity politics, except it's the identity of being a police officer. Wearing that uniform now gives you an identity that is a protected class, a protected status, against everything that Scripture says, you know, that you shall have one law for everybody, uh, and that you shall not be a respecter of persons, certainly not in, under law. Under biblical law, there is no respect of persons because God does not respect persons. But now we have placed in effect we have framed mischief using law, quoting Psalm 9420, and we have, in fact, respected persons officially. Now, what happens, of course, is eventually everyone's going to be a member of a class, and there'll be no more individual justice, and the biblical justice is going to be left in the lurch, which is the only true justice anyway. Where is the church in all of this? It's checked out. Too many pastors don't want to get involved in this. Uh, they are uh, silent, and their silence is deafening, and it condemns them. So, 
Now that we know that there's a problem with identity politics now being a, uh, a selling feature for the protection of police from and against biblical law and against principles of restitution, etc., that would apply to them if they were normal citizens, uh, we're going to reap a huge whirlwind as a result because people see this and they say, okay, then what about our identities? Uh, everything's going to be seen in terms of these groups and in terms of social blocks and you're going to have exactly the kind of class warfare that uh, Marx was telling us about because the premise of communion of community has been essentially cut in half all connection between us has been violated the only connection is to your own group and you must be faithful to your group don't be a traitor to your group as opposed to scripture which says the only treachery that matters is whether you're a tra traitor to God. Uh, be, you have to be the friend of God even if you're the enemy of everyone else. And friendship with the world is enmity with God. So when we speak about the question of the police, we have big, big problems. And, bec and we also have this other issue is that when there is a lapse of lack of Christian self-government, guess what? External government comes in to fill that gap. Since we have failed to promote Christian self-government, and made, have not made this the main message of the kingdom of God, but rather have now couched it in terms of groups, and group identities, and identity politics, uh, we are in a, uh, uh, a bad way. I agree with Charles Roberts. The police are the Praetorian guards of the state, a higher order of being than you, citizen. And that's basically what this law that was passed in Austin uh, reflects. Uh, it is a hate crime now to uh, attack a police officer because he, he holds some special status that you don't hold, and therefore has special rights that you don't have. And again, uh, anyone reading, uh, listening to this should be aware that uh, the Bible says there should be no respect of persons in judgment. They are all to be at the exact same level, God way up here, and all of us naked before him, because that's how it's going to stand at the final judgment. And every judgment seat before the final judgment is supposed to be a uh, reflection of God's justice here in this world. And until courts see this, and, if, and it's not going to be Christian courts, because right now Christian courts are far worse than secular courts. It didn't used to be this way, but there we are today. Uh, until Christian courts actually adopt the law of God and walk in it and promote it and do what Paul says in Romans 3.31, establish it, uh, we're going to have a world of hurt, and we're not going to be able to deal with the police issue and roll back those abuses, because it was a process of time to get there, and it's not going to be instantaneously removed. Because you now there's a safety net that's been established, and it's the same with lots of other issues. That's why Rush Tony says you cannot simply throw out all the social safety nets if Christians aren't performing the poor tithe. There is no mechanism, uh, and, it, and so the state came in and filled that particular vacuum filled that vacuum. Uh, nature abhors a vacuum, and so does political culture. And so when Christians evidence self-government, then we take back those functions from government. And this would also apply to the police function. People are to govern themselves, and they are to have to police themselves, and they would hire, if they need to protect property or concerns, private um, security, and those private security functions would all be governed under biblical law, which meant that everyone's culpable. You'd have 100% liability for anything that you did uh, in any of those capacities because it is not an immunity that you were a police officer that you were able to do X, Y, or Z. What we find many times is that, say, someone is video uh, taping an act of police aggression where some the person that the police is working with dies, uh, and all those police then are hauled in and indicted. None of those officers will go to jail. But the individual who shot the video that uh, condemned them and showed them actually acting against the, uh, the citizen, uh, he's the one who goes to jail. And that's exactly what is the case uh, right now in New York. So when you have all these cases, you realize that something's amiss with the system. And it's because we uh, have been skating on this biblical autopilot for so long that we are far, far removed from it. You know, when a plane's on autopilot, it might be a in the right course and right altitude for a while, but eventually it starts to sink, starts to head toward the mountain, and that's where we're at at this point. So the police is a whole area of reconstruction that has to happen across the board in many, many different areas, and it's not going to be an overnight fix. But it can be fixed. We talked about prisons last week, and I would commend you to that whole point. 
we could certainly do a lot in interim terms to reduce the sin footprint of our nation. Same thing can be done with the police. But it starts with self-policing, uh, and that is something that we are not used to doing. We're used to um, outsourcing that to the men in blue. And you're trusting every man in blue to be a saint or an, and an angel. And the fact of the matter is, the doctrine of total depravity applies to, applies to them as much as to us. Some folks would say maybe more so, that the kind of person who is willing to uh, use a gun in a club may not be the same person who's inclined to talk someone down from a, a crisis situation. So, upshot is, is there's, a, there's a difficulty here, and there are certainly some Christians out there trying to uh, promote alternatives, which I think you have to do. You have to be constructive. You have to say, okay, here's an evil in the government system. So what do we do? We're going to provide an alternative government uh, from within that will grow and take care of the concerns of the community. And these communities will need less and less policing and essentially make that job obsolete because the community has now uh, taken back the parameters of its own uh, safety and security, which is as it used to be prior to the advent of the police in the early 1820s or 1830s, depending on where you want to put it. For those who want to argue this from a secular point of view, there's an interesting discussion by Roger Roots, are the cops constitutional? And uh, you can find that on the web, and it's a fascinating discussion showing that on constitutional grounds, uh, there's every reason that it conflicts with every single element that the founders uh, had in mind when they put together the U.S. Constitution, for those who aren't opposed to the U.S. Constitution. <laughs> for those who have issues with it, I guess that's irrelevant. And, of course, as Christians, we would argue biblically first anyway. Andrea has a question, <coughs> which I'll read as soon as I hydrate a bit. What is my take on Christians joining the police force? Is there a way to reform this? Well, here's the story. You can be, end up being like Serpico. Frank Serpico, of course, uh, blew the whistle. He was a whistleblower, and when he saw bad cops, he said something about it, and it cost him a lot, it cost him dearly. And he's still alive and kicking and commenting on much of what's going on these days in terms of the police. But so far as he, he crossed that thin blue line, as they say, and that meant that he wasn't the buddy of his police officers, and they're more, they were more than willing to uh, put him in a dangerous spot in the hope that he would be uh, mortally injured. He survived, but nonetheless, they made a film about him. Uh, it was, I think Al Pacino played the role. And the upshot is, we still have the exact same problems that Serpico faced. So to be um, uh, a, someone who can look everyone else in the eye and say, I've observed the law of God, is going to cost you something as a police officer. I believe Paul Dorr, one of his sons, was involved in law enforcement and ended up having... Uh, because uh, he was willing to, to blow the whistle and to do everything correct, not be on the take any of these things, uh, they made life so miserable for him, I believe he ended up having to depart from those uh, that, that land of work. It was not even possible to be a Christian in that setting. And, of course, that was a young man who was fully equipped to bring everything to bear of a, of a biblical worldview into that area. And uh, he was... You know, he had to make some very serious decisions. Was he willing to go all to the mat every single time for every single thing when he was being singled out uh, for um, oppression because he wasn't going to toe the line with injustice perpetrated under color of authority? So, not such an easy thing. But for someone who is absolutely sold out and willing to uh, reattempt what Paul Dorr's son did <laughs> and, uh, and, 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 and go to the mat... Uh, that's fine. Uh, but these, we should be, be praying for these people because they have a long, difficult situation. Very few departments are still premised on older moral moralities and ethics. Um, we had it just recently, I think it was in uh, the Lou Rockwell report, uh, the website. The question arose, well, this officer uh, raped this suspect. And the response was, well, we have to see if that was a violation of policy. So once you are saying that policy is the true God of the system, and the policy, of course, can never be total because positive law has to cover every single thing. Well, what kind of rape was it? Uh, what was the kind of 
I don't get into the evil details there, uh, was that against the policy? So when you uh, throw out biblical law, which is very clear in terms of all the boundaries that it lays, and then go to policy statements and say everything is, if he did it according to policy, you can't complain. You know, he, he did everything right. We might give him an administrative leave, which is a paid vacation in the view of police critics, and that's going to be the end of the story. So a tough road to hoe, and that's how we hear from police critics. He says, you know, if they were good cops, they would be reporting on the bad cops, but the bad cops aren't being reported on, so we're not convinced that there are any good cops, or police officers, as they insist on being called here in Austin. If you call them uh, something other than a peace officer, you'll be corrected by the uh, legislator at the Capitol here. Uh, they, they're very picky about how they frame these new folks that have these new immunities and these, this new status as a protected class. And even the t term that you're allowed to use to refer to them uh, is uh, protected. That's saying a lot, that we're now so, so concerned about policies and terminology that the substance of the evil that's done in the, under color of authority uh, is lost to us. That would be my, my comment, and anyone willing to go into this area should talk to uh, Paul Dorr about what his son went through. I'm sure you'll get some interesting feedback on that. Yes, localism and police power is in the nature of the American system. It should be pointed out that that was a very, very early work by Rush Tunis, and the collapse of the uh, police departments wasn't as evident then as it is now. It was evident but not to the levels that uh, subsequent uh, 50 years, half century, have a uh, spade gap, have put between us in the composition of that book by, uh, by Rush Tooney. Which, uh, that's, interestingly enough, there was, um, I believe, the original form of that, and I saw that Gary North had passed this on as a uh, pamphlet, pamphlet form originally before it ended up in uh, Nature of the American System. I think it was a preface by a police chief of some sort. And it's not as if we don't sometimes listen to something that a police chief has to say. I believe in the Journal of Christian Reconstruction there was, in fact, an article written by uh, Daryl Gates. This was probably before uh, he got in the, the heat over the Rodney King catastrophe. But the upshot was, uh, depending on what they had to say, uh, we would sometimes, sometimes publish them. But did not constitute a, an endorsement by any stretch of the imagination. So it's, it's important to note that. Thank you for that. Now, about this totalitarian power, I want to read a little passage from Revolt from Maturity for y'all. That's Texas for plural you. And it had to do with the death penalty related to the family, because, of course, Cain was not to be executed by Adam and Eve. And this is on page 99 of Revolt Against Maturity. The power of the family does not extend to the death penalty. As the cradle, nursery, and school of life, its function is restricted to the discipline of life. The death penalty is the function of the state. Because the family has such great powers, to give it also the power of death is to make it totalitarian. Since mankind in Cain's day was one family, father, mother, sons, and daughters, God at the very beginning restricted the power of the family in this area. It was more important to preserve the boundaries of the family's power than to bring judgment in time to a murderer. Now that's interesting. It was more important that the boundaries of power, that in other words, that totalitarianism, be restricted and 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 blocked from coming to place than that the murderer be executed in time, temporally. Um, in other words, Cain actually ended up having judgment on the other side of the of death. He used to face uh, God as a murderer and the white throne to come but he was not executed for his crime in time, in history. Uh, he walked, in other words, as we say, because the family was not to have this power. Now, this is where it gets interesting, because the family was not allowed to have the power of the death penalty because it had these other functions. What were they? Cradle, nursery, school of life. It uh, covered all the aspects of life. So for it to cover death itself would mean that the family had all power. So that power was restricted from the family. What has now happened, of course, is that the state is now taking responsibility for the cradle, the nursery, the school of life, all education. And we have cradle to grave security and instruction uh, at the state. The state is new, the new God, the new family. In fact, this, when they say it takes a village, you're saying that the state is really the true uh, father and parent and family to your child. All children are the wards of the state. Uh, and this is the view of many states that you are simply given those children 
borrowed their state property, they're not your property. And they're certainly not the heritage of the Lord, as the scripture asserts. So that means if the state has the cradle, nursery, school of life, all of these functions that were family functions and the death penalty, by definition, this boundary that was laid out way back in Genesis 4 has already been breached. And totalitarianism is here now because all these functions are covered by the state. One other reason I'm mentioning the book Revolt Against Maturity is that I believe tomorrow we're having our Calcedon Book of the Month event. If you haven't signed up for it, do so, because the book to be discussed is Revolt Against Maturity. And uh, I see not only did uh, uh, Andrea put up our the actual book itself, but I believe she'll shortly put up the link for anyone who's not yet signed up for the Book of the Month Club discussion of Revolt Against Maturity uh, to go ahead and pull on that and get that. That is a book that at least one OPC church that I know of has actually gone through chapter by chapter in its entirety. That would be Kevin Swanson's church in uh, in Colorado, which is an um, interesting process. If you walk your entire church through this book, uh, it'll be eye-opening in the extreme. Very, very powerful book. I recommend if you haven't signed up and you have the time, uh, or you can make the time, go ahead and be, participate in this Book of the Month Club discussion and uh, definitely you want to have a copy of this book if you don't have it. Ah, thank you. There's the registration, Earl. So we're good on that, and we have that covered at this point in time. Revolt Against Maturity, uh, an amazing work on the psychology of man, but it goes so much deeper. I actually saw, I just uh, extracted a passage from it concerning why the family does not have the death penalty power. Otherwise, it would have nothing denied to it. It would be a total totalitarian institution, which it is not. It is a godly institution. All the families of nations shall worship thee, according to Psalm 22. So all the families are to be brought under Christ. That's true, too. Um, for those who don't make it, you can uh, the recordings can be listened to afterward. I believe some folks who weren't able to catch up with my discussion of the book Sovereignty were able to uh, listen to it afterward and get the benefit of the discussion, which was uh, quite involved, as I recall. But it was a joy to be able to do that. Um, I had the pleasure of, like I said, writing the foreword to that book by Rush Tooney. And it's, uh, it was also a powerful volume. And that brings back again the question of sovereignty versus the policeman. Uh, is it possible that the police are sovereign powers? Are they truly sovereign? Are they truly the god in the system? When they confront a situation, are they the god of that situation? Or do they have purely delegated authority from God and, it just, and the state cannot usurp any more than what God allows in terms of force. And remember, we're talking about the coercive sector of society. If that's not constrained, the wrath of man shall not praise thee. The scriptures are very clear. And we have the Lamech situation. Recall the individual Lamech? Rashtuni speaks to him uh, and about his case in Genesis, where here's a man who says, you know, 70 times 7, well, uh, if someone hits me, I'm going to kill them. Uh, I will have uh, outsized force for anyone coming against me. This attitude of Lamex lives today, and unfortunately it sometimes lives in the authoritarian figures known as our policemen. Uh, because the system not only permits it, it seems to um, cultivate it. And until our system moves in a different direction, we're going to have a problem. And why does the system move in that direction? because we are alerted, look at all these problem areas, that we have to deal with them somehow, and this is the way that we fix these, these problems in society. And society is going to continue to devolve and, and decelerate and, and crash into the thing unless we hold it all together by force. Uh, that's not going to work. And without Christian self-government, things are always going to fall apart. The center cannot hold, is a famous uh, poem that Rush Tony liked to quote at length. Because without God at the center, nothing holds together. All things cohere in Christ, the scriptures assert. And we have to be faithful to that. We've had relatively few questions, <coughs> except for Justin's, concerning uh, possible devotionals. By the way, uh, there's another interesting devotional, uh, not by Rush Tooney, but worth reading. And I can recommend it because Rush Tooney recommended this author. It's Class Schilder, S-C-H-I-L-D-E-R. And the reading I have in mind... They are called um, Gold, Frankincense, and Myrrh. It's just four volumes, and each one has three months' worth of devotionals for the year. Each one's got a 
different um, date on them. I presume he has leap day figured into that. I do not know for a fact, but you can always repeat some other lesson on leap day if uh, push comes to shove. But these are absolutely excellent uh, messages by a, a Dutch scholar that Rushtuni found uh, extremely edifying. Rushtuni in particular gave the strongest uh, reviews to a bigger work by Schilder known as the Schilder Trilogy about the crucifixion, trial, and death of Christ. And uh, Rush said, once you finish reading it, you'll realize you'll never read anything like that again. The same author did an excellent job with these devotionals. So I've even got given uh, as gifts sets of this four volume set by Schilder uh, to other uh, folks as a gift because it is so good. So definitely can recommend that because Rush Tony likes Schilder too. It's good enough for Rush Tony, right? It should be good for us. Uh, see any other questions popping up? We have 17 viewers live today. That's quite a quite a number. And I've been told, do not, under any circumstances, beg for questions. So what I will do instead is hydrate. Did you notice that the um, a lot of folks ran, got into the notion of trying to ascribe blame for these hurricanes? I find that fascinating. Jennifer Lawrence was saying, that uh, the actress, that uh, the Harvey was sent to Houston because Houston voted for Trump, for example. Now, it's interesting that everyone is so quick because, of course, you know, when Rahm Emanuel says, don't let any disaster go uh, unexploited, in effect, uh, same thing goes for here. If some natural disaster comes out, then Christians will jump on and say, let's exploit this disaster for... Um, for pulpitary use, you know, from the pulpit, use it to explain things. Now, there's a valid way to go about that, and there's an invalid way to go about that. And uh, but we're very quick to go jumping down the throat of every single natural catastrophe uh, until it hits us, because there are situations where God says you know, even the just will be swept away with the wicked. So you can uh, draw conclusions as much as you might think. And you might assume that you yourself are pure as the driven snow, when in fact you need to do what we all need to do, which is to search ourselves and, uh, and, and, and realize that we are certainly way out of kilter with the law of God in so many respects. Uh, we should be mindful of these things. So uh, it's no doubt in my mind that a, that righteous nation that lives according to the law of God is not it's going to be uh, anything other than protected by God, even from hurricanes and things like this. But the entire, what the mystery, and I would quote John Gerstner this, is not that things are so good, but that things aren't so much more worse than they are, because we deserve much worse than we get. God's grace is uh, open on us all the time. So that's an important point. Thank you for that. That's also a well put, because Jesus deals with the Tower of Siloam question, and uh, that's a fascinating discussion, though. Were they greater sinners than anyone else because the tower fell on them and killed these 18 Galileans? And that's the passage that's being uh, brought to bear by one of my technical folks here uh, from Luke 13, 1 to 5. You cannot draw the wrong conclusions from them. Unless you likewise uh, repent, you shall perish in the same way. So it's important that uh, the, the, if there is a lesson to be learned, it's a lesson for you. It's not. <laughs> you need to internalize uh, these events. Uh, take note, a uh, compassionate note of what's going on around you. So, welcome Jenny, welcome Vincent, good to have folks here. Getting a lot of thumbs up for doing nothing. Man, if my day job was only like that. Ah, here we go. How should we think about disaster relief and funding relief efforts? I think the uh, an important aspect here um, important aspect here is that we want to have absolute minimum overhead and also to work with folks that you know if possible, uh, not to go uh, impersonal and to the largest group. Uh, there's been some criticism of the Red Cross in regard to this issue, how much is actually not going to Harvey but to other things that you may not know are going for. So if there's a truck heading straight to Houston, uh, 
then that's the and you can put things on that truck that are going to get straight to the needy then by all means step up um, to extend your hand to the poor is one thing the women of Proverbs 31 does she stretches out her hands to the poor to the needy those in crisis and that's an honor and a blessing and a privilege to be able to do that to have enough substance to be able to assist maybe to do without so that someone else can you know, who's has a lot of loss is able to recover somewhat from that that disaster so I think that's it's important to be a part of that and uh, our family at several different levels has uh, participated in that uh, some of each kind one which was an individual uh, thing for one person at the work said my family my, my, my brother's house did this catastrophe and he needs these things and I'm collecting to take them tonight and of course so you know one person is going to be helped and that's an important aspect and other times it's going to be a group it's going to be uh, an entity it might be a church group that's going in the sad thing of course is that when FEMA gets into play boom all of a sudden the private rescuers are told that they are not qualified and they're not legitimate and uh, we've had something that I've talked about many times in restaurant he's dealt with it in easy chair tapes where the assistance provided by uh, the private groups is uh, shunned and criticized and sometimes it never gets where it's going because the state wants to be the sole uh, provider of uh, our need. Cradle of grave security, uh, the care of FEMA, but not from you. See, I think I missed a question. Justin, I am not going to uh, touch on how the Sabbath ought to be observed today until you finish that sermon series by Lee. <laughs> Aren't I mean? That's because uh, we need to have that background information uh, on us. By the way, there's a fascinating uh, set of appendices to institutes of biblical law. They don't always appear in the translations into other languages, but there are, one of them is by Dr. Gary North, and it's about the Sabbatarianism. He talks about the Bessemer Converter. What's a Bessemer Converter? It's an instrument that's necessary for creating steel in your culture, aircraft quality steel. And the odd thing about a Bessemer Converter is it takes about five days to heat it up and five days to cool it down which means that if you were to strictly observe the Sabbath in your culture, you could not have steel, at least not that great of steel, uh, which means a lot of things that we build would not be buildable. So the question, and he puts this out there saying, look, uh, the benefits, I'm not saying it was benefit of Sabbath breaking, but he says, obviously certain things come to a uh, an area where they are necessary, and the Sabbath was made for man, man, not for the Sabbath. So. He says a lot of strict Sabbatarianism, Sabbatarians are not willing to do without steel in their lives. But if they were consistent in their position, they'd have to get rid of all the steel. If it's the razor blade or whatever, it's got to go. Uh, use a, um, I guess, a, a scallop from the sea to shave with, whatever that might be. But the upshot is, uh, Dr. North does a fairly good job of, of surveying uh, the implications of a strict Sabbatarian position and showing that it, it runs up against some serious problems that the other side hasn't taken into account. That's not to mention even the whole issue of which day is the right day. Uh, Rosh Tuni in the passage on the Sabbath uh, follows um, an interesting writer that uh, I think correctly observes that the Sabbath actually rotated because the extra days were inserted around the calendar and so uh, it gets more complicated. I believe we've posted that before, but it's certainly worth reviewing uh, what uh, Dr. Rushtoni has to say about whether Saturday was always a Sabbath. In actual fact, every single day of the week during the course of several years becomes a Sabbath, and it rotates. It's not always Saturday. So I think the principle of one and seven to rest is, is a valid one, but we have added a lot of things to it that we'd be hard-pressed to find in Scripture. But you do find them in churches. Okay, what was behind that? I have not covered, and that was the third question. I remember, it, I, you may not have been here, uh, Nancy, when we started the discussion, I said um, there were two or three issues that I was going to take up. I remember two of them. And I did discuss the Nashville statement, which Gordon brought up, and then the uh, whether the police were legitimate, which I think Andrea brought up. <laughs> yeah, well, Justin, I, I'm, I'm kidding you halfway, but it's important to see that that you need to get your legs under you with these these issues and and get the best of all the scholars. Okay, so uh, insurance. Uh, again, we have the problem that it's a regulated industry, and that tells us something already that there's a problem with it. 
the problem is that we are not allowed to make our own decisions in our in contracts in terms of how to handle risk and mitigate it in various forms. In other words, to pool risk and put it together and say, under these conditions, uh, we wouldn't expect so much damage from these kind of events, and therefore we can all work together and assume that only a fraction of us are going to participate in this, and we can create our own safety net. And the insurance companies, so long as they were private and operated faithfully and, and kept their contracts, it was certainly a legitimate way to go. Uh, but that's not the case anymore. And of course, once the government comes in and says that it's the insurer of first recourse, like it's going to, like the single payer health insurance plans that are being floated to further um, totalitarianize our, our culture, uh, the worst things are going to get. So, um, and I think I mentioned the, back last week that in the Antithesis magazines, I think there was some discussion of the uh, biblical basis uh, going back and forth. Uh, on insurance and its value, uh, and its and its merits and its legitimacy. Under what conditions is it legitimate, and what conditions is it not? I, I don't think it's true that you must always take your lumps. That uh, that you should seek no protection whatsoever from what could happen. Uh, we always take precautions, and there are those in Scripture. He even uses uh, examples and parables of someone taking precautions. But sometimes the precautions don't make sense because you're only protecting yourself from things of this world and not considering the God with which you have to do. Your most important kind of insurance that you need to take out is with God, <laughs> in the sense that you must be make peace with Him and op operate in terms of Him. So then, whatever else might happen, at least you know you don't lose your soul in hell. Man can uh, kill your body. But God can kill your body and put it and cast your soul into hell. So, you need to operate in terms of that. And again, um, my tech lady tells me remember to always submit questions in advance if you have them because it, it gives us time to put them front load them into the beginning of these discussions, which I'm more than happy to do and apply a little uh, legwork to them if they require it. Others are suitable for off the cuff discussion. Appreciate that, folks. Uh, if we're nearing the end of our discussion, and I never have an idea if that's the case or not, or because if we go dead air for more than a minute, I know that my tech person is going to say thank you for all for joining us, and we'll see you all next week. But I, th I definitely spent a considerable amount of time on the Nashville statement at the outset, and I think it's uh, important that we realize that. Uh, the other side is always going to pitch its headquarters between the sea, the people, and the church, the temple of God, out of the Lord's house. And the only safe place between these two places, oh, we have a couple of minutes left. Well, dead air, is it so bad, dead air? Uh, only safe place is to be always centered in the house of God. And this for several reasons. One of them I think is important is laid out in Psalm 73, where David says, you know, how is it that the wicked seem to prosper, and, and nothing. they get all that heart could wish, and they grow fat, and how is it? And so what, what benefit is it to me that I follow God's law, you know, and when they're blessed so much, apparently? And he says, but I thought as a brute animal, and I didn't understand their later in until I entered the sanctuary of God, and then I understood the situation. From the perspective of eternity, surely thou hast set their feet in uh, shaky places. And their foot shall slip in due season, as Deuteronomy 32 or 34 verse 35 informs us. So it's a good place to be when you have your feet in the temple of God and see things God's way. I guess I'll have one more interesting comment. Oh, thank you. Good to have you here. Someone had asked the question about uh, Rush Dooney's work, and is it not true that we should be read a bunch of other folks first? Uh, read a wide swath of reform scholars first and then get into Rush Tooney late in the game. And I said, well, the point is that folks that start with Rush Tooney as Christians usually do get into all the other stuff because they get a hunger for the heritage of the best of the reformed writers. That's not always the case if you start with your Turretin, your Calvin, and your Bavink. Oftentimes, one, you might listen to all the black balders who made it their business to drive Rush Tooney out <laughs> of all consideration and discussion. It happens all the time. 
And secondly, you might end up in one of the pietistic strains. You might get into Meredith Klein, who says, don't ever bother reading Bonson and Rashtuni and North. So uh, those become closed uh, byways, uh, backwaters of the Reformed faith. So I think, and the other question is, what's the wider Reformation? What's the wider tradition of the Reformation? And that can be taken several different ways. The person who mentioned this, what he meant was the wide tradition of all these authors. But I said, but wider can also be meant, let's take a look at systematic theology. Who's wider and who's narrower when it comes to systematic theology? Rashtuni nearly doubled the amount of loci, the amount of topics that are discussed in systematic theology. Just look at the two volumes that he has and the topics he covers. He's got the, actually the wider approach to applying the scripture compared to the uh, what we had before. But I think it's not a matter of either or, it's a matter of both and. Uh, we need to have both. But Rashtuni is one of the few folks that when you read him, you might say, this was written in 1960, Sansa was written yesterday. That's because there's a time, timeless component to him. Some of him might be dated, but a lot less of him is dated than most people because he was able to see with the eye of faith into the future, and as he said, that always has the greater vision, not walking by sight, by faith. Uh, let's see, from my perspective, how has the Theonomy debate changed from the time of Bonson and Rashtuni? Uh, I think it has become more vicious, is one of the ways uh, we get preemptive arguments. We get, don't even listen to them. There are entire books that are written I have on my shelves, and some of them I've dealt with, which are uh, an attempt to bring into force, some of them at least, this thing we talked about with the Nashville Statement, the organic approach, a new good, and to oppose the evils of biblical law, as it were. And uh, so we, we get a uh, much more severe attack upon the law of God. We expect this from antinomians in the church because they've staked their claim uh, and their livelihoods on the uh, law of God not being valid, that uh, they can tell folks just walk by faith, you know, led, be led by the Spirit. Here it is in Romans 8, that's all you need. And they'll tell you that whatever the new covenant law is, it's some other law than the law of Moses, which goes against all principles of interpretation. So there's the element of the viciousness, there's the element of the dismissiveness, uh, as uh, evidenced in McGlasson's attack on the Christian Reconstruction which we published under the article False Flags. I wrote the review of McGlasson's book called No, big capital letters, quite a few, several inches tall on the cover. Simply no, just no to theonomy, no to reconstruction, no to presuppositionalism, all of it, no. And postmillennialism, no. So we get to this point where it's not a discussion anymore. It's just no, talk to the hand. And that means that there's been a deterioration of Christian discourse. I think we were much more gracious in replying to that than uh, those folks were in attacking the position. It has to be determined scripturally. Thank you all for listening, and I appreciate you all coming and uh, making me part of your Sunday afternoon. We will see you next week, and uh, send your questions in advance, and invite your friends. We always are glad to see that these uh, particular Q&As get several hundred views afterwards, so people seem to get some benefit out of them. Until that end, we're prayers with all those in Florida and still in Texas coming out from under these catastrophes. Be in prayer for those in need. I'll talk to you next week all. God bless.